and he used these tools to impact, preserve, and protect the future of his beloved New York. He also had an amazing ability to speak extemporaneously on any preservation topic and could get his point across persuasively with the facts. He listened and cared and respected everybody. I'm glad we're all gathered today to reflect on his contributions and share memories. We will conclude with a new initiative in his honor aimed towards inspiring future generations of preservationists. Please note the coleus that are at the reception and at the desk out there, the plant. They're a symbol of Jeff's nurturing side as he loved to cultivate them annually and see the surprisingly beautiful array of colors and leaves that emerged each year. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm very touched to have been asked to speak about my friend Jeffrey this afternoon. <clears throat> Thank you, Laura. Laura and I did not check our speeches with each other beforehand, so you're going to hear some repetition. But I think that just brings home the point that it's all true. <laughs> As I was thinking about him for today, I started missing his voice. And I knew that he had done an oral history interview uh, with the New York Preservation Archives project. So I listened to it. And it was conducted in 2012 by Sarah Scher. It It's an amazing interview. And I hope you all listen to it. It's long, <laughs> but um, it's really good. And it brings Jeffrey, boom, right back. So, what stood out to me the most, listening to that, is how crammed full of information his mind was. So Sarah would ask him a question, and it would remind him of 25 other things, and then he would be leaping from topic to topic to topic as he responded to her, but the leaping always connected a multitude of disparate but really pertinent dots. And I thought to myself, how can he do that? His dedication to Queens also comes through loud and clear, as well as the breadth of his interests regarding historic preservation. Few academic historians are involved in historic preservation, said Jeffrey, who was an academic historian involved in historic preservation. <laughs> But how did he get involved in historic preservation? Well, I didn't know how, but I found out in those interviews uh, that it was like so many of us do through a particular building. I was thinking about the buildings that got me involved because they were demolished for I-95 in Philadelphia, which just collapsed over the weekend. So I was, <laughs> that was my start. Well, his start was different. In the early 1980s, enrolled in LaGuardia Community College Queens History Program and living in Astoria, he met Susan Tunnick, who's sitting right there. <laughs> and she, at the time, was pushing for the preservation of the Terracotta Building, which I think everybody in here probably knows, uh, under the Queensboro Bridge, which was then a development site. Jeffrey joined her in that effort, he got hooked, and thereafter, I think in his mind, he always equated preservation with advocacy, which is what so many of us here do all the time. Continuing his involvement with Queens, he soon met Nina Rappaport, who was then the executive director of the Sunnyside Historical Society. The two of them, decided to create the Queensboro Preservation League to discuss what should be preserved in Queens. In 1990, they published Historic Preservation in Queens, which was give, uh, under the, uh, a grant uh, given to them by the Kaplan Fund. In reviewing it, the New York Times said, with a sense of affection and urgency, I love that line, Two leaders of the landmark movement in Queens have compiled an 88-page book 
called Historic Preservation in Queens. Jeffrey Kressler and Nina Rappaport present 35 structures they believe warrant individual designation, together with 23 possible historic districts and six scenic landmarks. Jeffrey was never afraid to name names. He was always quotable with his take no prisoners style. This is very evident in the long series of editorials he published, Jeffrey was a really good writer, over the years to express his views and to influence thinking. Regarding an ill-conceived proposed statue of the English queen, Catherine of Braganza, in Queens, she was actually Portuguese, the statue was one-third the height of the Statue of Liberty, Jeffrey said, it's kitsch. <laughs> On the subject of the excuses for the demolition of the 1939 World's Fair Aquacay in Flushing Meadow, he said, saying something is riddled with asbestos is the best refuge of the scoundrel. <laughs> Such a good one. And speaking very pragmatically about political strategy, he said, unless you get your city council member behind you, behind your preservation issue, it doesn't happen. Sound advice. Although his heart remains in Queens, which you heard, Jeffrey became involved in historic preservation in the larger city by joining a number of groups. The Citizens Emergency, Citizens Emergency Committee was one of the first, the Preservation Committee of the Municipal Arts Society, the Historic Districts Council, where as you've all heard, he served as a board member for 30 years and the City Club of New York, which he and I were both on the board of, and which he was president of at the time of his unexpected and sudden passing. In working with these groups, Jeffrey never flinched from the tough issues of historic preservation. He could be combative, and his preservation heroes included some notable flamethrowers. But he always approached issues with a sense of responsibility, a fair and considered argument, and most often, a fine sense of humor. Kent Barwick characterized him as a true son of the city, youthful, open, serious. It's clear, he said, he was the real thing a city father, and he was. Thank you. Well, I really wish I was giving these remarks at a presentation of the Landmark Lion Award to Jeffrey, instead of at an event that he's not here. There's a famous Talmud saying attributed to the sage Tarfon. It goes, it is not your duty to finish the work, but neither are you free to neglect it. Jeffrey could not finish his preservation work, but he never, ever neglected the work of preservation. He was truly dedicated to the cause. As we've heard, he was involved in the Historic District Council for over three decades. I'm glad he said yes all those years ago when I asked him to join the board. Unlike some unnamed others, he never blamed me for having ruined his life through that request. Though perhaps he was just too polite to say so. He was recruited to the board because of his passion for and knowledge of Queens. That passion and knowledge soon expanded to encompass the entire city and his civic involvement grew well beyond the HDC and culminated in his role as the president of the City Club. 
over the years, no matter how disappointed Jeffrey might be about the state of preservation, and there was usually something to be disappointed about, he never gave up, even when he knew the odds were against him. He would still write that brilliant op-ed piece. He would still mount that insightful public program. He would still go to the endless regular meetings and those special meetings necessitated by one assault or another on the buildings and neighborhoods he cared so deeply about. Even when his decades of experience in the trenches told him a cause was hopeless, he never gave up. Testimony to this was his joining the steering committee of the Citizens Emergency Committee to Preserve Preservation, whose Don Quixote like mission was trying to stop the downward spiral of the Landmarks Preservation Commission. I'm not sure if it was the chocolates that Whitney North Seymour always brought to those meetings that kept Jeffrey coming, but he stayed the course. Now, Mike Seymour, who kind of helped run that, was a wonderful old school preservationist, dating from pre-landmark law days with deep roots in Greenwich Village. And he believed that every cause needed a song. And Jeffrey willingly joined in when we all sang the ditty that was commissioned for the committee. Don't worry, I will not be singing it today. <laughs> Jeffrey might have. I truly admired Jeffrey's courage. Just two examples of the many to make that point. In 2018, in the Environmental Law New York Journal, he published an article entitled, Losing Its Way, the Landmarks Preservation Commission in Eclipse. Not only was he willing to take on the Landmarks Preservation Commission, he was willing to go against the prevailing winds of our time, being a public voice urging the protection of the city's monuments even when others argued for their removal. His New York Daily News op-ed entitled, The Statue Topplers Insult Our History, begins, Hundreds of scholars of American art, cultural history, and social analysis have signed a letter to Mayor de Blasio's Monuments Commission calling for the removal of, quote, symbols of hate. I am not among them. He went on, uh, he went on eloquently to state his principal position on the subject. Jeffrey did inject his wit into his advocacy work. I remember a panel on the state of preservation advocacy at one of the HDC conferences that Jeffrey arranged. He called it, at the Alamo and down to our rifle rights. As a major domo of the Eli Walensky Fund, he would take the light when he could steer a modest grant to a neighborhood group that was taking on a developer or challenging the LPC itself. He was happy to root for the underdog. Though citywide in perspective and keenly able to focus on the need for systemic change, he had the heart, passion, and spirit of a grassroots preservationist. I miss Jeffrey not being at the other end of the phone to lament the latest outrage, and then to think through how, how one might best respond to it, and respond to it he would. In preservation battles, Jeffrey was the one you wanted beside you in your foxhole. He was the one you wanted to bring on a delegation to see an elected official, to visit an editorial board. He knew his stuff. He held his ground. He never wavered. He was also the one you wanted to bend elbows with at the bar or be seated next to at that benefit dinner. He was excellent company, great fun, droll, and a constant presence for good. Though our conversations always began and ended with preservation, we would also chat about such things as the old Cadillac he inherited from a family member, or as putting the dock in the lake up in Maine, or remodeling the house in the office. Dedicated as he was to the cause of preservation, it was not his entire life, which is likely why he was able to keep his sanity, and why he could stay involved in preservation for decades. One can only hope his example of persisting against the odds, of being on the front lines defending preservation, of never giving up hope, and enjoying life while fighting the good fight, will continue to inspire us all and those who follow us. The battles Jeffrey fought continue, and we are not free to neglect them. Thank you.
church, there's a wonderful garden next to it. There's a street, supposedly designed by Red, with buildings designed by Redwood. Uh, there's a great out there, this is not only great, there's a wonderful garden. This is this wonderful little capsule, which is in the middle of the densest city in the world. And this is the kind of things that Jeff really loved, the kind of juxtapositions, you know, unexpected sights and, and little bits of things that we can make a city. This is also where I met Jeffrey many years ago um, at one of HTC's events. Um, and we had a long conversation, the first of many conversations. We agreed, we disagreed. It was great to agree with him, it was also great to disagree with him. And he did our trade very well. Um, so it was, it, you could feel the passion, which was really s something wonderful in an exchange about reservations. Um, I miss Jeffrey dearly, uh, and we miss him on the board of the Historic District Council. Uh, we, miss, we miss his wisdom, we miss his passion, we miss his outrage. Uh, he, was, he was on the board of the for 36 years, uh, and, and he's part of our DNA. He guided our decisions, he's, he's part of the decisions we made to be ourselves. Uh, and he kept picking the good fights because he loved the good fight. Um, and so he was really critical in, in forming the historic district council and what it would become. Uh, he was he was he was a thinker. And at the core of Jeffrey, at his core, I think he was a historian, an activist, and an educator. And he was an educator fundamentally, I think. A function which he performed through lecturing, giving tours, advocating, and writing. He wrote profusely. I mean, he was a, a, a very productive writer, writing in many different venues, op-eds, books, encyclopedias, <coughs> law journals, various pieces. His last book, and I'm going to read the title of it, was is Sunnyside Gardens planning and preservation in the historic garden suburb with the restrictions of the long run, which are really good for photographs. So, so he, he was an educator, and I think it's fitting that, that we would honor him as an educator. And so I'm very pleased tonight to launch, on part of HTC, the Jeffrey Pressler Student Research Award. Uh, this is an award that will be given every year, uh, at least one $1,000 award to a student, a graduate level student who has done original top level research in, in subjects related to New York City. Jeffrey loved the city and, and we think this is a, a proper way to really remember him. Um, the great thing about this is that I mean, as a teacher, you know, you advise students on thesis, and they do their thesis, and then there's just a big void. It just, it doesn't, it doesn't go anywhere. And even if you, when you encourage a student to publish, they just get busy with, with having a job, and they just don't do it. So this, this is really important because it's going to provide a bridge between a thesis or research and getting that research into the world, uh, getting, giving it legs, and also to provide a bridge between the young upcoming preservationist and those experienced with the preservationists that we are. So I think it, it has a tremendous, um, a tremendous value both to the students and to us in terms of providing this bridge. Um, there is a, there is a, there is a there's an anecdote to this, of his history. Of this. A few years ago when I was president, we, we piloted such an effort. We invited the best thesis students to present their work to us. And I think we had one or maybe two such events. And the relevant anecdote here is that Jeffrey, and we didn't continue, is that Jeffrey, many times after that, said to me, why didn't we continue this? This was really great. And it was particularly taken with one particular thesis, which he quoted in one of his books. Of course, uh, so, so it was it was meaningful to him, and so we feel very, that is really a proper way to remember him because it was meaningful to him when he was alive. So, um, so we don't need to fret anymore. Uh, the Jeffrey Pressler Student 
research award is, is here to stay. Um, and I think we will have many, many interesting presentations. So in closing, I want to encourage all of you to contribute, to, to fund this effort, uh, and as generously as you can. Uh, I think it's I think it's a live I think it's a live thing. It's it's it, it it's sort of I can imagine that we will get to have more productive discussions with younger people as we attract them to our, our venues through this. They're going to be interested in us if we're not interested in them. So I hope you will contribute to this fund generously, and I think the staff has some flyers that you can take to get into.